All right. So first thing first, Stephen, how are you? I am pretty good. Uh, it's actually, I just, I, <laughs> I feel like all the interviews are going to have this because I've done a few yesterday and today, but it's weirdly really sunny in Brighton. Okay. Um, so it's, it's really beautiful at the moment. It's like really bright, really sunny, kind of cold. It's my favorite weather. Every day I wake up with that puts me in a really good mood. So I'm doing pretty great. That's very interesting. What, what is it about Brighton then that, that kept you around? Um, I think it, it's, <laughs> you know, there's a joke in Brighton um, that Brighton is the place for British refugees. Um, it's, ju- it's a town completely full of people that didn't fit in anywhere else in the UK. Um, and that's why I'm still here because it just, it feels like the right place for me. It's all, it's a collection of all people that were too fucking weird to live in the place they're from, from the UK, but, and also from other countries too. So everybody I know here is just doing something weird in their own way. And that feels like a very natural habitat for someone like me. So okay, I've never found anywhere good. weird enough other yeah. than here. And then you mentioned something interesting, and I suppose it has some somewhat of a connection to to this new album that you you guys made. But you've always felt like kind of not fitting in, or, or, or in terms of musical uh, identity and those kind of things. So even within Brighton, what was that like for you coming up as musicians? Yeah, I mean the the funny thing is, yeah, we've never fitted in, and we started out in a town full of people who are very much of the same mindset, but where we started out as a band was playing in the sort of DIY punk and hardcore scene. And uh, sorry, let me turn my emails off because they're making way too much noise. Um, we started playing this like punk hardcore scene where like everybody had black flag tattoos and Fugazi was seen as like the ultimate band. And, um, and I love those sort of bands, but we played in that scene because that's all we knew. And we met <clears throat> through that scene. Um, but we were writing these like pop songs basically. So the first thing we experienced was the punk scene fucking hating us because we'd show up, you know, with like, there'd be like four heavily tattooed men shouting. And then we'd show up and we'd play a song that had a chorus with a disco beat and they'd be like, get the fuck out, you know? So it was strange right from the beginning. We had this sense of like, well, we don't fit in here. And that, really for us has continued the whole time. We never feel like we ever fit in with any particular thing. Um, and now we've got to a stage where I, I'm really glad about it. I feel like what that meant is that we turned in on ourselves, reinforced our own relationship and our own kind of, you know, sense of being a little gang, us versus the world, and just sort of put our blinkers on and did it our way and did our thing whenever we think it's right. So we've never been tied to a scene. So it's kind of frustrating and it's not nice feeling like you're constantly treated like a, a bit of an outsider. But I think it also has allowed us to do sort of tread our own path, which I'm, I'm actually really glad about that fact. Yeah, because I was going to think that at some point that becomes the source of pride, right? Because you, you are... That's, uh... That's what I was trying to say. You've said it better than me. That's what I was trying to say. I'm fucking proud at this point. Well, because I, I can imagine uh, so many artists and musicians, they kind of bend to whatever, uh, uh, whatever is popular at the moment. Or, and, and you kind of, like you mentioned, forged your own path d- despite uh, some metalheads or something or punk heads <laughs> not liking you at the time. So it's, it's, well, let me ask you differently. What gave you, this, uh, what gave you and Laura this confidence to, to kind of do that and to kind of uh, remain strong in your convictions? creative conviction well ironically yeah we started out in the punk scene like i say and for us that's what punk meant it was being like i don't really care what i'm supposed to fucking do i'm doing what i think sounds good and we're gonna do it in the way we think is cool and fuck you if you don't get it and what was always kind of sort of hilarious to us was that we got rejected by the punk scene and we were like the punk scene has rules i thought the point was there weren't any you know and so to me, I think the reason that we have been able to do that is because we have that punk spirit. We've always had that spirit of independence, of saying, fuck you, we're doing it our way. This is what we think. And we're going to do it, you know, under our own energy. And we're not going to ask anyone's permission. We're just going to do our thing. Um, yeah, I, to me, that's just because we grew up as punk kids. Um, but we were too punk for the punks. <laughs> <laughs> but... 
Is that is that kind of the the last two years the way the world has been? Has that been brought you back to that mentality in a way? Because now you're just just sitting at home again, and you kind of have to figure things out for yourself, and it's not you're not pulled in any any kind of direction. Yeah, there's definitely there's been something. I mean, there's obviously been a huge amount of negative, but there's been something mm. positive about um, it. Sort of removed a lot of external things because you can't play because there's no sort of influence like there's no real media or anything happening to influence it it meant that um the two of us spent well for one thing we just spent a lot more time together actually because mm -hmm. you can't go and see all your friends <laughs> you know in england i don't know how the rules were there but a lot of the time you couldn't see anybody but you could have a bubble so you could have a small group of people you're allowed to see um <clears throat> and we both live by ourselves so we were able to spend loads of time together mm -hmm. so as a band we found we did kind of rediscover something a bit throughout this period because we spent a lot of time together, made a lot of music together, talked and thought about a lot of other things that we wanted to do. And it actually, yeah, it weirdly did bring us back together. Um, and I mean, until then, we lived in separate countries until this, right. literally separate countries. So there's been a lot of positive for our band. And I get a weird guilt about that because I know it's been a shitty time for a lot of people. Right. Um, but I think we've been quite lucky. Is, is there something you can share that uh, you learned or discovered about Laura or vice versa that you didn't know already? Uh, what have I discovered about Laura? Um, uh, well, here's what I, tell you, what I did discover. Laura secretly learned to drive. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and like the entire lifespan of our band neither of us can drive. So we always had to have someone else or hire someone to drive us everywhere. And then Laura secretly learned to drive and I had no idea until partway through lockdown, she showed up in my house in a car and was outside and was like, Hey, I was like, what, what the fuck? <laughs> so actually we spent a lot of lockdown, like driving around, listening to records just cause there's nothing to do. Um, and that was really fun, but she kept it completely secret you know, 17 years into our band and she secretly <laughs> learns to drive. So, so she now put pr uh, pressure on you to get yours as well. Yeah, now she hates it because she has to drive everywhere. <laughs> right. She can't like drink any wine and... <laughs> hey, I, I still don't have my driver's license either. I prefer... Uh... Oh, you as well? Yeah. yeah. It, it just, well, in the Netherlands, everything's so close, you don't really need it in a way. That's, that's how I felt about it. In Brighton, it's like that. I mean, in Brighton, you can't really drive anywhere. You can drive out, but you may as well cycle in this town because it's so small. Right. Um, <clears throat> what was it? Yeah, oh, sorry. Sorry, I was just saying, it's just fun when, you know, there's nothing going on, you can't go out. You can get in the car. You can drive along the seafront in Brighton and along the coast listening to music. Probably kept us kind of sane in lockdown, actually. What would you put on? What what would be the go-to, or would would it be a different album every time you you went for a drive? We listened to, I mean, and you can probably hear this on the record. We've been having a real little phase in the band of like '80s stuff. Laura's a real big fan of uh, Tears for Fears, mm. so there was a lot of Tears for Fears, a lot of Depeche Mode, and then also a lot of. Um, What's the Nine Inch Nails record that starts with every day is exactly the same? Uh, with Teeth. It's called With Teeth. That became a running joke because every time I got in the car and we were in lockdown and nothing was happening, every time I got in Laura's car, she put on every day is exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> so we listened to that quite a fucking lot. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that because when I was listening to the album, there was one line that kind of... Uh maybe summarize the last couple of years as well uh, in give up there's a line can't go outside because i'll catch the dis disease and now, now yeah. i know these songs were written before this whole thing happened right i know right that's weird because actually someone else said this to me and i was like i that line was written before i'd even heard of covid which is <laughs> fucking weird it just came out it's like i don't know maybe i'm psychic man. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah some some premonition or something <clears throat> But um, in terms of the sound of the album then, because that's one of the things that I heard, and especially this mix of fuzzy guitars and synthesizers and then kind of that ominous tone that feels very... One of my favorite uh, artists from the 80s is um, director... Uh, now I've, his, his name escapes me. John... Uh, what's his name again? 
Well, a movie director. Yeah, movie director. What was his name? Why can't I? John Waters? Carpenter, sorry. John Carpenter. John Carpenter, yeah. Of course. He has this, this, this kind of ominous tones in his movies and then synthesizes yeah, and these fuzzy guitars. So. He does all the music himself, right? Yeah. Is that right? That, yeah. Yeah. I know, the, I know the feel you mean. So, so um, what, was, there, was there a specific reason this, this kind of uh, eerie vibe or so, so uh, came to you? No. We don't tend to make plans artistically. We're very instinctive as a band. Um, we're not conceptual people. We're not, um, we don't sort of come up with like a, yeah, a preconceived idea of what we're going to make. We just start making. Okay. So we just keep digging. And then when we hit upon something we think feels right, and we always agree when it feels right. We don't always agree on the stuff on the way there, but there's a, there's always something with every record where we hit a thing and we're like, this is, this is the thing. This is what it is. And for us, we were fucking around. We wrote a lot of this record in, well, we wrote the whole thing in Los Angeles um, and we wrote it <clears throat> without a drum kit. We actually wrote it really minimal. We had this shit little electric piano, a laptop, and Laura had one Telecaster and that was it. There was no drums. So we were fucking around a lot on Ableton on our laptop. So we were playing around with synths and like drum loops and we were just writing different ideas, different on sketching out things. And we wrote morbid fascination. Mm. And that whole thing was built around a synth that we, we were like, that's way better than a guitar because it's got this machine like sort of sense of like doom to it that you can't do on a guitar. And when we hit that song, that's when we looked at each other and we're like, this is the record. This is what we're making. So from there on, we just kind of ran with that feel and that energy into all the other stuff we were writing. So it was never a decision. It was just this kind of trying sounds, trying things out, fucking around. But I think it was partly due to how we'd restricted ourselves in the writing process. Because I didn't have a drum kit to play. So everything was kind of machine-like from a computer and then also we didn't have any guitar amps. So all the guitars were plugged directly into an interface and we would just red light everything. So there's loads of digital distortion on the guitars, which has this really kind of unnatural, kind of ugly sound to it that I really like. Um, Cause you can't get that out of an amp. An amp always sounds kind of nice. You get a really fancy tube amplifier. You get this really sweet, like seventies retro tone. That's too nice. We wanted something abrasive and hard and kind of industrial. Um, and you can get that by using actually really shitty tools and just plugging a guitar straight in and maxing everything out. Is, is this approach to kind of the, the experimentation and then just going for something as you go along, has that always been the way or is, is Because I can imagine now that you've made a, a bunch of albums over the years, you have, a, you know, you have an audience. Does that affect the, the creative process at all? We've always done it like that. I mean, the first two records, I don't think we talked about any of it. We just okay. would play. And then, I mean, at, at that time, we would just play guitar and drums in a room as loud as possible. And then we'd figure out the singing. And then we would just be like, this is cool. And that was that. And then over time we started trying other things, but at no point have we ever, I don't remember ever sitting down and going, wouldn't it be cool if we do a thing like this? Mm. We never do that. We just start playing and writing. I think what's developed over time is that we allow ourselves to use different instruments and different things to what we used to. And I think we also, <clears throat> bring in more ideas separately than we used yeah. to. So Laurel might come in and be like, I was writing this this morning, or I'll come in and be like, I wrote this drum loop this morning. Instead of starting everything together, we bring in. And so we just have more stuff to go through. Um, right. But yeah, we've never, we've always worked in a very unconscious way. And we've always had this sense of trust in each other that if we both feel like something's cool, that's all it needs. We don't need to think about it. We don't need to discuss or question it or talk about it. If we both have that feeling of this is fucking cool, that's it. That's all we need. And we both really trust in that sort of, um, it's like a combined instinct that we have. Is, is there one thing we can delve in, something that maybe you brought uh, into the writing process for this uh, particular album uh, and then that you had to flesh out together? Is this something we can kind of delve into? Yeah. Uh, I mean, 
I brought in Morbid Fascination, started as a drum loop that I sang into my phone. Okay. So I have like a voice memo. It's literally just me going, it's really dumb. But so many ideas start with something that simple. Um, and I sang that into my phone on the way to the uh, rehearsal space where we were writing the record. So we came into the studio. I took that. I programmed the drum loop using drum samples. Mm -hmm. Then Laura played the synth like bass lines over it and started singing. And then we worked out the melody over that. And then within like two hours, we had the song. Um, so it just, yeah, all I brought in was a voice memo of the world's dumbest <laughs> drum loop. But that's all you need a lot of the time, you know? Um, what I find interesting about that particular song, uh, sorry to interrupt, um, okay. but, but, but there, were, there was an uh, acoustic version that, you, that the two of you played, and I, I saw that on YouTube, but which, which kind of, if you, that the song still works if, if you strip it all the way down. Is that an important right. thing in, in the songwriting process? Do you know it's a good song when you can do that? I mean, people say that, but we didn't mm -hmm. think about it. Okay. We absolutely did not think about it. I like that idea. And I think it's probably true that if it does work acoustic, then that's a really good sign that your song is like uh, a song in a very traditional sense of mm -hmm. what a song is, you know? Um, and I'm really happy that it works acoustic, but we, yeah, it wasn't a thing we like, we don't like <laughs> test the song to see if it works acoustic or anything like that. We just go with what feels cool. Um, and there's, turns out there's quite a few on this record. We've been learning them acoustic. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really fun. And I, what I really like, we tried out the song, I Am Not You, uh, yesterday, acoustically. And what's really cool about something like that is the song almost feels like it means something different. Mm. You know, when you take, when you completely change the context and it's not aggressive and everything's like maxed out and you just play on acoustics, the same lyrics and the same notes. But the feel is so different. It almost feels like you're telling a different story with it, um, right. which is really fascinating to me. I don't know how that works. It's like, it's a mystery to me, but I really enjoy it because, you know, you make a thing and then the thing becomes its own life. And then it starts to tell you what it is. You know, <laughs> it's like, I'm not in charge of this. Um, yeah, it's a wild world, acoustic songs. No, that, that, it's interesting what you mentioned because I... You mentioned kind of the, the, the unconscious way of, of, of writing. I don't know if that sounds right, but the, 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 the way of writing. And, and uh, I assume then, is that true for the lyrics as well? That it's a very much stream of consciousness uh, initially? Yeah. Um, the lyrics really change. Sometimes, I mean, a lot of the time, almost all the time, the music comes before the lyrics with our band. Um, and that goes for both of us. We both have notes that we write. You know, I write things on my phone when they pop in my head, or sometimes I hear a piece of someone's conversation and I like a sentence and I write it down. And I think, oh, one day that might be useful. Um, and Laura does the same. She has little bits and bobs of like trigger words or notes, but we always make music first. And the music usually inspires us to sing about a certain thing. So sometimes it just comes out in a stream of consciousness and then we kind of um, bounce it off each other until it feels cohesive and it feels right. Um, sometimes you go through, you're like, yeah, things that you've written in your phone notes and you're like, whilst you're listening to the song, something will click and you'll say, oh shit, that. Um, mm -hmm. But again, there's never a conscious discussion, oh, we should sing about this. It's always very instinctive. It's always very spontaneous and in the moment. Um, and sometimes, yeah, sometimes I write all of the words. Sometimes Laura writes all of the words. Most of the time it's a combination of the two, actually. Um, and I think sometimes people are really shocked because some songs that sound really personal were actually written by both of us, even if we don't both sing it. Um, which, but I'm sure, but I'm sure uh, the two of you are very aware of what's going on in each other's lives, right? Yes, too, probably too aware. <laughs> the lockdown, probably too much now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, because well, you mentioned I am not you, and and the way I interpreted it and the way it was kind of uh, explained in the track by track, it says it, it kind of covers what we what we talked about earlier about not really fitting in and then kind of. Uh, uh, 
acknowledging that not everybody's the same and people have different different uh, yeah yeah ways of doing yeah. things but so, but so how did that concept for you change when you played at acoustic because i find that very interesting it, yeah it's weird playing because that song was written like i say we um we got the music together on that song and uh i just grabbed the mic and started improvising the vocals and that's what came out and i just trusted my instinct it was a very i think of that song really as as you know kind of kind of teenage actually you know but i like that because i think there's something really pure about that feeling like fuck you know like fuck you i am not like you and i just went with that instinct but then you strip it and play it on acoustic guitar and it's much quieter And it takes on, instead of being fuck you, it almost becomes like sad. Mm. It almost becomes like, um, like, um, like it almost flips it the other way around or almost I sing, I am nothing like you. I'm nothing at all. It's almost like you feel sorry for yourself because you're not like something. Right. Like Which a lamentation weird. in a way. Like, yeah, it's really weird. It almost like completely 180 flips the meaning of the song just by changing the instruments it literally this only happened yesterday and i was really spooked <laughs> by it because we practiced it for a we're playing in a record shop and i was like this is like spinning my head out man i feel like i'm singing a different thing but i'm not yeah well, you, you mentioned playing uh, in a record uh, shop uh have you been able to play any of the new songs uh at all or No, no. Um, we haven't actually played live since the end of 2019. Okay. Um, like in any real sense, like we've done some live streams or whatever, but sure, that doesn't count, you know. Um, so no, and then we couldn't, our entire album tour last week or this week got completely cancelled. Right. Um, so the only thing we can do now It's really bizarre. So we can play in record shops um, because I don't know it's allowed and it feels a lot safer. And obviously, you know, there's 30 or 40 people in a record mm. shop is a lot different to hundreds of people this close to each other in a venue. Um, so it's really strange because the first things, the first time we're going to play this record in any way to the public will be sat, you know, on the counter at a record shop with two acoustic guitars. And it's like a really dark, really industrial, aggressive record. And that's how we're taking it into the world. It's fucking insane. <laughs> um, but it's the only thing we can do. So, you know, you just got to roll with what, you know, what the options are, I guess. Yeah, fair so enough. Nothing, nothing makes sense in the modern world, does it? Like nothing makes sense anymore. It's, 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 it's very strange. And I, I can't make sense of it. Yeah, um, I don't even try anymore. <laughs> I've, I've stopped after after the first year. Every everybody was so hopeful. Okay, 2021, we're going to be all right, and then then everybody was yeah. so hopeful. And after that disappointment, I'm kind of like, okay, whatever happens, happens now. Yeah, 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 exactly. You just you can't control it, so you just gotta like surf over it somehow. But you mentioned something interesting as well, the the tone of the record and kind of it, it almost, I don't know if you see, uh, see it as, as such, but it almost feels like somewhat of a concept record. And it, it, there is a certain, as you mentioned, industrial tone to it. Um, so the, did the live process influence uh, the live performance or potential future live performances? Did that influence at all the, the way you wanted the album to, to, or the way the album came out? No. We don't think about that. Okay. Like for better or worse, we don't. We we wrote the songs and we had once we had all the songs written and a, an idea of how they what they were and we had the song name, we had we did then have a picture of how we wanted to record it mm. so that it felt cohesive and it had a style that made sense throughout the record. Um so we had a pretty clear vision once the songs were there about the sound of it. But we didn't think about live at all, okay. not at all. Um, yeah, I think you'll probably get you're probably getting the idea now. We as a band, we just don't <laughs> think. Of it. We just don't think. We do, you know. We make and we trust in the process and we trust in our instinct, but we don't analyze or think or plan ahead very much at all, um, and we never have. And I think 
you know, that's, that can be a problem a lot of the time, but it also is part of why our music, I feel like is very pure and very genuine because we never let our brain get in the way. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, it almost sounds liberating in a way because kind of the, the paradox in, in what I do, in a sense, is I, I'm very analytical towards something that shouldn't always be very much analyzed. So, so I, Yeah, there's, um, what's the, there's a really great quote about that. Someone, someone cleverer than us <laughs> so once, once said something like, talking about music is like trying to dance about architecture or something like right. that. And it's like... You're right. I, I never really think much about what we've made until I do this process. Um, and I really enjoy this partly because it makes me reflect on what we do. And you, and quite often journalists will notice things that we don't even realize we've done. Um, right. So it's kind of, you know, it is good to reflect on what you do. It's not like we don't believe in reflection <laughs> or analyzing what you do. It's not like we think that's a bad thing. We just have a habit of not doing it. But I do think it's, it's kind of cool. Once you put something out into the world and people respond and they think about it and they talk about it, you get a different perspective and we can learn things from it. Um, I, I genuinely enjoy like good, good interviews make me think about something we've made in a way that I've mm. not thought about it before. Um, which is a useful thing. Well, I find that interesting uh, because for many people, the last two years uh, was a time of reflection. It was kind of a, a putting the pause button, see, kind of getting your bearings and seeing where you're at in life. And, and yeah. for you as a band, perhaps not so much in a creative sense or, or about individual songs, but did you have somewhat of a reflection uh, alongside Laura to kind of, look at what you've accomplished in your careers and, and where you want to go with it? Yeah, we did have a bit of that, actually. I don't think we had a clear idea where we wanted to go with it, because I don't think we ever really know. Mm. Um, but we did have a real reflection and we did have a real sense of like pride, actually. We had a real sense of like, fuck, you know, like we kind of looked at a lot of the bands that were around when we started and how most of them aren't here anymore. And we kind of looked around at the landscape and especially in guitar music, which is, you know, at this point, quite unpopular. Sure. <laughs> and we kind of were, you know, sat there thinking like, you know, we can see on social media, but we can also see like on streaming, like there's lots of problems with streaming. But one thing that's kind of cool is you can see people's listening habits for your band. And, you know, we could look at that and we're like, we have people all over the world listening to these songs you know, we've been around 17 years. We've never really had any big support. We never had any big break. We don't fit in fucking anywhere. <laughs> no one can ever describe our bands as a certain type of thing. They never know what to call us. <laughs> and we kind of had this sense of pride. We were like, we're still here and we still got cool ideas for new stuff. And that we did have a kind of a reflection and it was kind of, I really enjoyed it. We had a sense of like, I guess a sense of achievement mm. in ourselves that this is not an easy thing to do. And we were kind of like, wow, you know, we've survived, <laughs> we've actually survived quite a long time, like more than average. Um, What's the secret then? Because as you mentioned, the music business is a very volatile business. So, so what's the secret yeah. then? The secret is try and keep your head out of the music business as much as possible. <laughs> um, I don't know if we have any great advice. The only thing I do know is that as human beings, right? And me and Laura are like, you couldn't find two more opposite people. <laughs> really could not. But I think the thing, aside from that we agree on a lot of music, we, we communicate. I think what means that our band is still together and still able to musically move and do things is because we actually communicate. Sometimes that communication is screaming at each other because you're angry, but that's still communication, you know? You're still expressing I think we kind of accept that arguments are part of it. Um, but yeah, we just, we, we talk a lot. We talk every day and not just about the music, just as humans and the bands I've seen that are friends of mine that fall apart is when as people, as friends and, and musically they grow apart and they're just not talking and they're not experiencing the same things and they're not kind of checking in on each other. And for us, I think a big part of why we're still here 
is like we're actually friends and we actually you know talk and hang out and laugh at the same shit and watch send each other podcasts we find about serial killers and we're like have you seen this one <laughs> like we still have that i think that is crucial and that's not really about the music that's a more human thing um that's my that's the only thing i think that, that really has made a difference well, two uh, last things then. You mentioned a podcast about serial killers. Was that, yeah. an, influ was that an influence? And all those Netflix series about the, yeah. uh, the Yorkshire Ripper and the Night Stalker and all those kind of things, were they Night influences? Stalker, the Night Stalker, um, there's a scene where they keep cutting past this scene of downtown LA, mm -hmm. right, in that show, where he was near a bus terminal. We wrote the album right by that bus terminal. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, it has been an influence because we watch that stuff and we've been listening to podcasts about serial killers on tour. I mean, people used to ask us like, well, what are you listening to in the tour bus and stuff? And we'd be like, it's not music. We're listening to podcasts. <laughs> so it was very natural for us to write about those things because we're not just right. You know, you're not just singing about stuff a serial killer you're telling you're singing about something you feel but you're just using that as the method you know you're telling it through the eyes of that or using that story but what you're talking about is something more personal um but there's so much of that in our environment it absolutely influenced us and being in los angeles when we wrote the album which is like some of the really iconic murders sure you know in the 70s and 80s are in la i think we just felt very like I guess strangely it was that it's sort of inspiring to us mm. sounds a bit creepy but <laughs> but it's tr it's true yeah, but I think there is something interesting and there's something to that the, I mean there is a reason why so many people like those kind of uh, murder mysteries or, or serial yeah. killer document I mean I've, I've read a bunch of books about psychopaths and, and it's, it's it's just very compelling yeah, I, I agree. I think there's some, there's a real pull and you can tell because there's so many more of them every week on Netflix <laughs> sure. that people are really drawn to it. And and we are too. I don't exactly know why, but it's that fascination, I guess, with the, the darkest elements of humankind. For me, I'm always fascinated by those people who are right on the edge of society. Mm. They're yeah. almost outside of society. And I'm, that always seems interesting to me. And I, you know, my armchair psychologist uh, perspective is like, well, maybe part of that outsider thing is what we find fascinating as a band that have, we feel like we've always been treated as kind of outsiders to everything. Mm. Maybe there's something in that that we weirdly relate to <laughs> or, you know, or, or it has some sense of like um, magnetism for us because it's something we understand. Um, yeah. So that, yeah, that, I mean, that stuff's all over the record. It's, I, I find it very, especially I had this with the, the Yorkshire Ripper one, where, where I'm so fascinated how somebody can lead a seemingly normal life, but then be this brutal murderer some of the time. It just, it makes no sense to me. It's, yeah, it's just it fascinating. Is, it is. It's completely fascinating. We are both like actually really addicted to this stuff. <laughs> if one of us finds a new podcast, it's the, we'll text each other straight away. Like, I found, there's a new one. There's a new one. So it's something quite, else horrible happens. <laughs> Have a look at yeah. this. Yeah. And it's funny because we always joke, like, as a band, we don't take ourselves seriously. You know, as people, we're not fucking rock stars with shades on all day. We don't think in kind of very big conceptual ways. We, we mostly are just dicking around, making each other laugh and being silly. But we take... <laughs> what we do really seriously and the things that we're always interested in are usually quite extreme and intense and quite dark but i don't think you'd expect it if you met us as people because <laughs> we're just kind of goons you know <laughs> it's funny it's like i feel like we have this like secret life and on this record that secret life's actually coming out a bit and you can kind of realize who we really are <laughs> <laughs> the big expose now um, yeah we're actually serial killers no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. final question then um because you uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, laura and you are very much on the same side uh, musically oftentimes but is there maybe one artist or one song that that one of you loves and the other absolutely hates Yes, Laura loves the Smiths, uh, and I fucking hate the Smiths. 
highly is mess. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to ask why. Why? Uh, I don't. I just can't listen to that guy singing. <laughs> Fair enough. As soon as he starts singing, I just I want to like jump through the speakers and stab him in the throat. I can't hear it. I hate his voice. I hate he sounds really insincere and fake to me, uh, and and kind of weirdly egotistical. And then you know you find out in real life that he is. So <laughs> you gotta find yeah, out I was, he, since I was a teenager, I just. I don't know what it is since I heard the Smiths. I was like, I hate that singing. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and vice yeah. versa, is there something you like that Laura hates? Yeah, I really like Queen. Uh, I really like the kind of like really flamboyant 70s Queen that's really over the top. And Laura can't fucking stand it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Steven, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and talk with me. Uh, it's been an Thanks, absolute man. pleasure. And, uh, yeah, that was yeah, a good one. That was interesting. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I wish you all the best, and hopefully you get to play the songs uh, live properly yeah, like, very soon. Yeah, loud. It's, it's, loud. You mentioned the tour being cancelled. Uh, are those the shows in the Netherlands as well? Yeah, all, the whole thing uh, for Jan and Feb is gone. They're trying to reschedule something in summer. Um, so fingers crossed that we yeah, can play. Let's keep our hopes up. I really hope so. Especially like we have great shows in the Netherlands. I really hope we can come over then. Well, I really, always a I pleasure really... to have you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Have a good day.